My name is Aaron Williams. Um, I'm a senior engineer slash you know, dev advocate with Ampere Computing. Hi, everyone. My name is Kate Goldenring, and I'm a senior software engineer at Fermion, where we do a lot of serverless web assembly work. And our, to uh, our topic today is the future of the green cloud, serverless web assembly on the on the ARM64 architecture. And as you can tell from that title, you know, we're gonna be talking a lot about, you know, green architecture. And, you know, just to kind of go through this real quick, you know, set up the problem. We know that green, uh, global warming is happening. It's a big issue, you know, throughout the world, but we still need more and more compute. And this really does affect people. Communities around the world are being forced to decide between having data centers and all the good jobs that they create or housing. For example, in West London, there is going to be no new housing until 2030. And this is so that the electrical infrastructure can catch up with, you know, with all the data centers that are put in there. And I do want to kind of in this quote, I do want you to kind of look at a couple of these numbers. Right now in a data center, a rack is about 10 to 14 kilowatts. That's kind of the standard. But these new data centers are being put in with 60 to six, uh, excuse me, 40 to 60 kilowatts per rack. And that really adds up to a lot more energy that these data centers are going to be uh, consuming. And really just to kind of start this off, you know, what can you do about this, right? You're not going to quit your job. You don't control the building of data centers or even how they look. But what you can do, though, is control how your code is written and what architectures you run on it. So you can look for ways to improve efficiency. And the first thing you need to do is, you know, understand that you actually can do something, right? If you can't do anything, you're not even going to look at it. And then you need to know how to measure uh, your carbon impact from the code that you write. How and then actually, how do you do this? And then try to make your best choices about how the software platforms that you run run ones that are more efficient. And same thing with the hard, the hardware side. And that's kind of what this whole thing is: is to give you guys the power and let you know how you can make changes. So this is from uh, the Green Software Foundation. So for energy efficiency, this is the idea here: is to use less electricity while you're running your software. And then second, choose your hardware on that same thing. So that way you're using fewer resources to perform the same tasks. Um, and that hardware is also more efficient. And the last thing is really to be aware of the carbon, um, how you're doing it. So is there stuff that you can do, like simply change times of day of when you run um, your tests and things like that. But also region shift, move from something that is uh, carbon intensive to something that is much less, you know, has a lot more solar. So how do we measure this stuff? Well, the, once again, from the Green Software Foundation, software, the software carbon intensity is simply R by, excuse me, amount of carbon by R. And the R there is kind of the resource, meaning, uh, you know, process, uh, processing an order some unit that you're running your software. Sorry, I can't use my hands. And then now with the carbon part, let's break that up. Let's uh, move inside of that. So M here, this is the emissions of building the chip and the hardware itself. So this is you know when it comes into the uh, data center, all the carbon that is already put in there. Your, your software is gonna be charged uh, for the amount of how often you use it and for how long you use it. And we already went through kind of what R is, and then the operational emissions. We'll break that into E and I. Uh, I is the carbon intensity of the power coming into it. Once again, this is, you know, if your plant's, uh, excuse me, if your DC is next to a coal plant, that's really bad. Uh, next to solar, that's much, much better. And the energy E is just the energy that is consumed by that actual software. So the best case for your software is to use the hard, to use the hardware as least as possible. And then for that hardware also to be as efficient as possible. So fast software is great, but if it needs to idle in between starts and stops, that's not good because you get charged for all of that energy from the time that your program starts to it ends. So now that we have this software carbon intensity formula, and we know that that is the equivalent of E, or operational emissions, the amount of energy I need to run something, M, embodied emissions, the amount of emissions 
uh, created in order to create that hardware that I'm running it on? How can I bring down the O and bring down the M? And how can I have a green software stack for my application? And so we think a green software stack has four parts. One, you can choose an to implement your entire application with an efficient programming language. It's a bit hard one to do. You can choose an application architecture that is density oriented. So it makes it so that you can run as much as you can on a piece of hardware. You can choose an isolation mechanism that is fast switching. So it starts and tears down as fast as possible. And you can choose to run this all on top of power con conscious infrastructure. So we're gonna walk through each of these four and talk about the software you can plug into each part of the stack to get that green software stack. For starters, um, there was research that came out and was updated most recently in 2021 that basically took the same application and or the same program and implemented it across various programming languages and then uh, observed how much energy was used in each of those languages. It found that implementing your application in a, a language such as Rust would use, make your application use 75 times less energy than implementing it in a language such as Python. And so this is pretty powerful if you as a software engineer want to write code that uses less, um, less energy. However, we don't always as software engineers get to choose what language we implement our code in. Sometimes we're using legacy code or are tied to certain libraries, or maybe our company just doesn't use that language. So this is a great approach to take if you have the power to take it. If you don't, um, there are other options, such as your application architecture. And the goal here is really to do as much as you can with the same amount of hardware. And we've seen waves of this over time. We've seen how originally this started with the virtual machine, where now I can write monolithic applications and I can scale them next to each other. Then we moved to the microservice model, where actually I'm breaking my application into separate microservices so I can scale individual services instead of needing to scale the whole monolithic application to meet needs of all the load that my application's getting. Then we saw serverless come to be where we're scaling individual business logic units or individual functions of our application. And now we have even more precise scaling. So that way we can have even more accurate scaling and get even more out of our hardware. However, serverless hasn't fully achieved uh, what it's set out to do. We haven't gotten the density we wanted out of it. And part of that's because existing underlying technologies of serverless do not scale to zero. And so ideally, we can get an even more packed server, go from that one serverless image to the next, and we can find a technology that can support that. Um, so talking a little bit about the problems with existing serverless. So underlying technologies today that are used for serverless, one of the predominant ones is the micro VM, which is what is behind AWS Lambda. Micro VMs can take up to a second to start if you do cold starts, which means that you end up waiting longer for your isolation mechanism to start than you do actually executing your code. So the workaround for this is for AWS Lambda, um, they say, don't worry, um, cold starts only occur in 1% of invocations. But if you look at that from the sustainability perspective, that means that they're pre-warming 99% of instances. So that means they're using resources on the host before you're actually executing your code. Um, and that is because we have those really long cold starts. We have a similar issue with containers when used in a serverless um, architecture. Um, Azure Functions is backed by containers and Microsoft Research found in 2020 that the cost of keeping these applications warm, so keeping the containers running, was prohibitively high for Azure Functions. And that's because the functions were getting requests about one, per, one time per minute or less. So it was just enough that they had to keep the containers warm, um, that they couldn't tear them down because it takes so long to bring them back up. And we're at uh, KubeCon, so to talk about this problem at large within Kubernetes clusters, um, on average, 69% of CPU cores in Kubernetes were unused. And so we're not getting the most we can out of our hardware. And so we need to find efficient application architectures that help us utilize all that we can from our hosts. So going back to that picture, we saw each of those application architectures, and now we know the underlying technologies under each of those. So what's that underlying technology under the scale to zero serverless? And you're probably not surprised, we're at WasmCon, it's WebAssembly. Um, and WebAssembly is an isolation mechanism for our code. So it works in multi-tenant environments, just like predecessor technologies, such as micro VMs, containers, VMs themselves. However, it starts in less than a millisecond. And many of you probably already know this, but for folks who might not know what WebAssembly is, 
It's a way, uh, it's a portable compilation target. And what that means is I can take my favorite language of choice, whether that's Go, Rust, Python, or maybe JavaScript, and compile that down to this .wasm file. And I can take that .wasm bytecode and run it anywhere where I can put a WebAssembly runtime whether that's on the edge or in the cloud, whether that's on a certain OS or a certain platform, it's portable across all of those platforms and architectures and regions. And going back to why this is our scale to zero solution, um, WebAssembly is isolated. It fill, fulfills that requirement that we need for serverless. It has a secure sandbox um, and capability-based security, which ensures that you only get access to host resources that you're explicitly granted access to. Um, it's portable, like I just mentioned, it goes, it can go everywhere, which is great for all of our DevOps. Um, and it's very small. If you are to implement an Express.js app and containerize it, that can be around 300 megabytes. That same application as a WebAssembly component, three megabytes. And if you're using something, a language such as Rust, that could get down to 200 kilobytes. And as we know, that startup time is incredibly fast with WebAssembly. So how can I get started doing this with open source tools? Um, Spin is a project that I'm a maintainer of that my company Fermion has been working on for three years now. And it is a developer tool for writing serverless WebAssembly applications. And it aims to make this experience super simple. It's three commands, spin new, you scaffold your application, spin build, you now have your .wasm file, spin up, you're now serving it locally. So let's go ahead and quickly look at that experience. Um, we're gonna have to do a little bit of a window juggle here um, for our screen mirroring. Here we are. Welcome to our terminal. Um, let me clear this all out. That looks decent sized. Um, so let's do those commands. Let's do a spin new. These are all the templates spin provides for you. You can also um, implement components and languages other than these provided, but I'm just gonna go ahead and use a template. And you're also choosing what is triggering your serverless application because serverless applications are event-driven. So we see HTTP here, Redis. You could also do um, MQTT triggers. You could directly invoke with commands. You can even plug in your own trigger with the spin. But let's do HTTP. Since we're at KubeCon and there's a lot of Kubernetes developers, we'll go ahead and do Go. Um, and just pick a name for our application, maybe Hello Spin. And some description. I'm sorry, I'm not very creative. And then this is where you say what triggers your application. You can have it be the wild card for that entire, um, for your whole application, or you can sp choose a specific route for your HTTP requests. I'm gonna choose hello. And now we can go into that directory that's been scaffolded for us. And we'll see here that we have a, a Go application that's been created for us and our spin.toml. This is the spin application manifest. Let's start there. So this is what you des this describes the layout of your spin WebAssembly application. And here you can see we have one WebAssembly component that's triggered by um, HTTP requests to the route hello. You can see what resources are allowed to this component because we have capability based with security. This component is actually not allowed to make any outbound requests. We could add hosts here that it can make outbound requests to. We can also add SQLite databases it can use, key value stores, etc. And then we have the command for telling spin how to build it, which we've scaffolded for you as well. Um, let's go ahead and look at our actual application. Um, this is just an event handler, um, and all it's doing is returning hello fermion. We can customize this. Let's just say hello wasmcon. And then we do our next command, which is just that spin build. So now we're taking that Go application and compiling it down to WebAssembly. And now we have that main.wasm, and then we can spin it, uh, spin it up locally. And now this is, uh, spin is waiting for requests, and for every request it gets, it will load that WebAssembly module into linear memory and execute it in its sandbox. For every single request, we get finite levels of security. So let's go ahead and um, just hit this with some Bombardier for five seconds. So we're issuing request after request after request saying, hello, hello, hello. And we can go ahead and see, um, on average, we had a latency of 3.38 milliseconds, and we, ish we created um, 370,000 WebAssembly components in that amount of time. We loaded and, and, and sandboxed and executed. And I realized that it was really hard to see what was happening there, so let's just do it once right here. 
So that's what was happening every single one of those requests. So with that, let's go ahead and go back to our presentation. Awesome. And like I said, not just HTTP triggers, you can trigger your serverless event-driven applications with whatever triggers you choose to plug in or any of our existing triggers. And um, we just did this locally, that was exciting, but we wanna put this somewhere. So you can run Spin um, on Fermion Cloud, which is our multi-tenant platform for running serverless WebAssembly, or you can run it on Kubernetes with SpinCube, which is an open source uh, project that was, um, is a conglomerate of work from four companies, Microsoft, SUSE, Liquid Reply, and Fermion, to make it easier to run serverless WebAssembly on Kubernetes. And we have, we actually just announced two days ago, um, there's a marketplace offering for installing this in Azure on AKS. If you wanna just, we tested this morning, it takes like six minutes, and you have a, a Kubernetes cluster with SpinCube installed, ready to run serverless WebAssembly. And you can also run SpinCube on EKS, GKE, wherever you can put Kubernetes. Uh, a little bit about SpinCube, I mentioned it's those four projects, but it's the classic, um, what it's powered by is this ContainerD shim. Essentially, we're telling ContainerD to execute WebAssembly instead of containers under the hood. And at the top level of it is a spin operator because of our Kubernetes and everyone loves operators. Um, and that's basically making it so that you can declare in YAML what you want to be running on your Kubernetes cluster. And now that we've talked about where you can put this, let's go to the fourth part of our green software stack, which is the architecture. And so uh, before we start you know, with the infrastructure, let's just go through some quick terms that we're gonna go through or that we'll need going forward. One is performance, and this is just quickly or simply flops. This is how fast your, um, your chip is, how much you can just push through it. Uh, you know, no restrictions, no nothing. Performance per watt, now we're starting to put that restriction in there as how efficient this is. The simplest analogy for this is think of a dragster doing a quarter mile, you don't care, you want the speed of it. Um, it's absolutely wasteful from, uh, you know, from how much fuel goes through, tires, everything like that. Completely wasteful, but absolutely really cool and fun to watch go down the thing. Uh, once we put in that limitation of watt, you know, how much is this doing per unit of energy? Now we're really starting to care kind of on a day-to-day -day basis. The next thing is performance per rack. This is how many servers you can put in there and what they're made of. So you're taking that server and you're kind of expanding it to a rack um, point of view. Then, I mean, you really can then take that to how much you can put into your data center, but data centers um, are widely different from each other and everything like that. And the last little bit is the kilowatt per watt, excuse me, kilowatts per rack. This is what I was telling you at the beginning. Most data centers that have already been built um, have a rack of about, eh, I think it's 12 to 14 kilowatts. But what they're now doing is, is because of uh, GPUs and AI and x86 uh, servers that are getting just so massive and use so much energy is that they're doing this, uh, they're putting in those 40 to 60 kilowatts uh, racks just to be able to handle them. So as uh, Kate was talking about, you know, about utilization and, you know, density and how we do it, this is the hardware side of that. So we need chips that once you start once you uh, start them up and putting a load on them, that they uh, can handle it and their performance stays. So this red line here, this is ARM64. Uh, this is an ARM64 server. It can handle that and it's pretty linear as it grows. If you look at x86, around 50%, it really drops down. I mean, it's still growing. I mean, it's still doing more work, but it's becoming less and less efficient. And why is this? Well, this is one of the biggest reasons is SMT, which is simultaneous multi-threading, right? So on each of the x86 cores, they actually uh, give you two virtual cores, right? And so now you have to split, which is great. Up to about 50%, they're not really, you know, 50% load of the server, they're not really uh, worried about it. You don't need to use SMT. Once that starts happening, 
you have the problem of one of the of a noisy neighbor. It's called the noisy neighbor problem. And simply what that means is if somebody, one of the threads blocks to go get a resource or doing IO or anything like that, it has to pause, right? And that also means the other thread is now blocked. So now you have two blocked threads. On ARM64 servers, it's one thread, one core. This is why ARM64 servers have so many more cores and it's very core dense. And it's, so this can happen to, you know, more load, um, you get the predictable performance that you would expect out of it. And so we really need that high utilization because this means less servers and we have to build less things. All right, so let's kind of show a little quick little example of this. And it's simply how many CPUs do you need to do 1.3 million requests per second? And if you look, uh, top line is Intel. Um, it's 82 CPUs, and in our thing, we're making the assumption that this is uh, two CPUs uh, per server, so that would be 41 servers. And then what we're gonna do is we're gonna stack these into a rack. We're going to give this the perfect scenario of where uh, you don't have to put space between the rack, uh, excuse me, between the servers to make sure things are cool. We're just gonna pretend for everybody that it, everything's the best case scenario possible. Then if you move down to AR64, ARM64 servers, they only need 18. Once again, they need 36 CPUs to do it, but only 18 servers. Why? Back to you know SMT, other things for the throughput of getting the thing. Anyways, now, if you, the reason these things are stacked this way and this graph is this way, if you notice the th uh, 18 servers will fit into a 42U rack. Uh, versus you will need three for that Intel server. Thus, once again, trying to be more, more dense, more better utilization, both of CPU, the, you know, the silicon itself, and then the server, and then the rack. And this really adds up. Oops. And this adds up a lot. So now if we think of those Intel servers, they're at 850 watts per server, and then we need 41 of them. Simple math, multiply it together, and we almost get 35 kilowatts per hour. That's a lot of energy. Versus um, on the Ampere ones, the ARC64, that is 18 times 705, so it's 150 less already per server, and so many less servers to begin with. And so now you end up with that 12.7 uh, 12 kilowatts, which is, once again, enough to put into a rack. So it's still one rack. So kind of wanted to uh, kind of have a little conclusion slide here, and it's kind of really obvious is this, you guys do have the choice or have uh, some options when you're building your, uh, your software. Um, if you use a more efficient stack for that, like Wasm, uh, great, that's better. That's going to save energy, save carbon, you know, great. If you have a choice with uh, your hardware, if you choose ARM64 servers, uh, once again, that's better. But if you can combine this stuff, you know, building uh, you know, Wasm on ARM64, you end up with a much, much better solution. And now for some cool demos. Yeah, so let's go ahead and look at the combination, this, this part of the matrix, matrix that we want to be at, the Wasm plus ARM64. Um, when we were releasing SpinCube, this, this text is unfortunate. Um, when we were releasing SpinCube, we wanted to un help people who are using it in their clusters to be able to test their uh, production applications to see how they were doing performance-wise. And so we created this um, performance suite that if you're familiar with K6, it's a tool for load testing applications and has an operator for Kubernetes. We essentially are using that um, with uh, our a Kubernetes cluster configured with SpinCube and ran a series of um, load tests and created a repository so that people can use those load tests and also add their own. And the way it works is whenever we want to run a load test, say we're releasing a new version of that container D shim, we'll come in here and um, create a new one. And uh, we this test is pretty extensive. It terraforms an entire cluster, it installs SpinCube on it, and then it runs um, a bunch of tests. Um, and so instead of going ahead and doing that, we've already have um, one that's completed that we can look at and obviously add the P for the Ampere nodes. Um, 
there, and um, this is all on AKS, and you would just put your Datadog dashboard ID there. There's also Prometheus set up in here if you wanted to use that. So we can look at a previous test and just go to that Datadog dashboard and kind of see what the results of it were. And you can see we're using pretty small nodes because we don't want to, because they're kind of expensive runs if we used too big of machines. Um, so it's about eight gigabyte and two core machines. And one of the tests we run to see how language tooling is improving in the WebAssembly ecosystem is if we take the same Hello World app across languages, how fast does it execute? And so this is something we're just keeping a tab on to kind of see. And we'll see if we go back to our like first part of our green stack, it still matters what language you choose. Um, uh, that still does help um, with the, the speed of execution of your code. Um, Another one we do is as we scale up the number of replicas of, of our um, application, say you wanna use um, pod auto scaling with SpinCube, you'll see that um, we're still staying flat on requests per second, which we were curious to test out. And then here's the one that's interesting, which is um, ramping the request per second. You can see the CPU usage as we ramp up just immediately drops down after the test too. So we're scaling all the way back down there. Um, so this was just a suite that we've kind of have to get started and are hoping to let it grow naturally um, for assessing the performance of your WebAssembly applications. And if you, uh, just to kind of summarize someone who's walked through this um, and done this basically experiment of, okay, I was using containerized serverless and wanted to move to serverless with WebAssembly, the Zeiss group did this. And once they moved to SpinCube, they were able to reach a higher density without um, losing performance. And what this resulted in is they cut the cost of compute by 60%. And part of this cost cut was because they not, once they had moved to WebAssembly, um, they had higher density, but they also could choose what architecture worked for them. So they switched to Ampere-based um, VMs in Azure, which were less expensive as well. So moving to WebAssembly gives you that flexibility to constantly change your architecture decisions. Finally, if you wanna interact with more WebAssembly, uh, we have a really cool demo that's gonna be all across the show floor today. Um, Microsoft, Fermion, Ampere, and Akamai are all participating, and we're gonna have a sound sensor at each of these booths. Don't worry, it's vibration-based. We're not recording you. And what it's gonna do is basically, uh, we'll, that sound sensor will capture the level of volume at each booth, which it will then send to an MQTT broker. And then we have an MQTT triggered spin app that's going to grab that value and persist it in a SQL database. And then a backend component that will then be able to serve um, time period uh, chunks of all those sound values. And then a front end that displays it all very nicely on a chart. And the idea here is we can gauge how much uh, people are engaging with a booth based on the amount of sound happening at that booth. So we'll be able to have a line for each booth, might get a little competitive, but see which booths have the most sound and activity happening around them. So definitely check out those booths, make some noise at each of them, maybe a lot at Fermions, um, and see if we can get a really cool um, chart going there, all powered by WebAssembly. And with that, uh, you can also find us on the SpinCube channel on the CNCF Slack. And we appreciate all of your time, thank you. If there are any questions, I have a mic and running around, but uh, since I have the mic first, I'll ask a real quick question. Sure. Uh, can you automatically uh, set up, uh, you know, to figure out where is the best place you can run on uh, SpinCube? Um, are you talking about where is in what region is the most sustainable? Right. Yes. We don't do that for you, but a lot of cloud providers do that for you, and there's a lot of tools out there that will help you understand what region to run your application in that's using more sustainable energy, whether that's a certain area of Europe that has more wind or solar, um, but we don't have anything to help you with that. Uh, so I have a question about SPIN, uh, very amazing demo. Um, I'm wondering, uh, what is the support like for like third-party libraries uh, when I'm working with, let's say, TypeScript or Python um, WebAssembly? Um, for example, uh, I'll just give a concrete example. For example, uh, if it's a HTTP handler that uh, processes an image, and when I was doing in Docker, I would uh, have to install some like system dependencies at the OS level. Uh, so, uh, are these packages will these packages be supported? when I move to spin. Yeah, um, what exact library support is supported in each 
language ecosystem is a really good question. Um, and that's across the entire language ecosystem, not just specific to spin. Um, but for example, with Python, one that a lot of people ask about is pandas, which recently Python now has support for. So over time, we're adding support for more and more libraries. For image analysis and basically image changing, we've done already some, I know we have demos where we've done basically changing the filter on an image or you know, uh, making it vintage looking and all of that. So I know we've found ways to do that and that was in JavaScript, but I don't know the exact libraries um, that are capable of doing that and whether we have support for those specific ones. But that's certainly a great question to ask within, Spin has a Discord. So if there's a specific example you wanna do, definitely check out Discord there and we can look at exactly how you would make that happen. Does that depend on the maintainer of these respective libraries or is that a, an effort that, uh, I don't know, WebAssembly or, or Spin uh, would take care of down the road? Sometimes both. Um, I believe for NumPy, that was an effort for componentized Pi, so that nothing the maintainer of NumPy had to do. And then other times, you may need to change your library to target, for example, WASI HTTP or something like that, if you wanted it to be more native to the WebAssembly experience. But a lot of times, the library maintainers are left ignorant of it, which is the best case scenario. OK, thanks. Hi. Um my understanding of 32 and 64-bit um, WASM is, is a little bit flawed and, and lacking, and I'm, I'm just curious if um, the utilization um, optimizations that you guys were showing, uh, was that using 32-bit WASM, and um, how does 32 versus 64-bit uh, play into uh, server utilization? Um, I am not sure on 32 versus 64. I'm pretty sure we were using WASM32, um, but I don't know how we would see performance trade-offs between the two of those. Yeah, that's a great question to ask. And um, one place that would be a good place to get the answer to that would be in the Bytecode Alliance ZULIP to see if people have played around with the difference in performance there. So can you compare this to um other solutions like K3S, like where does uh, Spin pick up and Kubernetes leaves off? I heard the container D reference, but are you able to make a quick comparison to something like that? Like, uh, what was the like K3S for K3S? example? K3S. They try to compile all of Kubernetes into a single binary. Kind yeah, of um, SpinCube works with K3S. Um, so K3S uses its embedded container D, like you're saying. It um, kind of brings everything together into one package, but that container D still has a configuration file. And basically under ho the hood, what we're doing is we're um, updating the container D configuration file so that it's aware of the spin runtime. And so when it sees the spin runtime class, it executes the container D shim instead of run C. Um, and Kubernetes has native support for that with its runtime class type. And um, the runtime class manager that's a part of SpinCube does all of that for you. So it will go find that container D config file based on the runtime. So it knows where K3S is, update it, and then you're good to go. Okay, and a, a follow-up. So like how, how much more portable does that make this? For example, could it be used in the local dev or dev container scenario? Like if you wanted to deploy, say to an artist's machine for a game scenario, you know, they're not very technical. They want to get set up. You want everyone to have the same dev environment. Kubernetes has been a little bit heavy. Do you think something like this could make inroads there? Uh, I'm not aware of the efforts to put K3S in a dev container, but my thoughts would be if you can put K3S there, you probably could put us on top of it. Um, but I would also recommend in that case, maybe just using Spin as well, which is what we like about Spin is that you have the same exact developer experience locally as you would running it in the cluster. So you can just execute it locally in your environment and it works across your language tooling. So. Um, I'd probably just use Spin instead, but I would love to see someone put K3S in SpinCube inside a dev container and try it out. And lastly, does it work with like traditional like Kubernetes CNI? Like, could I use Calico or Celium with it? Yeah, so the networking is all above SpinCube's level um, because what is happening is that it is running as a container the pod, it's still within a pod scope. So it still has a pod IP and everything. So all CNI above that still works just as normal. Hey, thank you very much for the demo. So I have a question. So if I have an application that really doesn't need to scale to zero, um, but just need to scale up and down, 
Is there any benefit I would get going to Wasm versus staying in Kubernetes with an optimized autoscaler? Would you describe the application that doesn't need to scale to zero, but just describe, but just scales up and down is basically a long-lived service, something like that? Yeah, yeah. I, my personal opinion is if it's a long-lived service, there's not as much benefit to using WebAssembly because you're not getting that teardown, tear-up. But if you still want to use it as the isolation mechanism, it's still great, um, and you could use that instead of containers. But you might not be interested in that trade-off to all that is open and available to you using a container instead.